I've just been told recording is in progress. So welcome everybody to the third EDXC Zoom meeting. Um, we're really fortunate and we've got at the moment there's 33 people from all parts of the world, North America, Japan, India, Russia, Scandinavia, all the, uh, France, I better not try and list all the countries because I'll miss some out and not be very popular. Um, as, as you know, we've got Sheldon and Mika who are giving our few presentations and I think it's a nice combination of um, different viewpoints of DX in from different parts of the world, although both fairly, fairly far more. Um, so Sheldon, can I hand over to you? And I know you have a presentation for us. It would be really interesting to hear. There's, yeah, I'm not sure where the <laughs> where those sounds are coming from, but anyways. I'll, I'll keep an eye on the sounds and try an ear on the sounds and try and okay. come out. Yeah, I'm uh, I'm ready whenever you are, and uh, we've got uh, um, as we go along. There's a few of our uh, column editors and whatever who are here, so they can maybe sort of just you know wave to everybody uh, when we get to the uh, to that section of the presentation. So whenever you're ready to go. Uh, we can share the screen and uh, get things set up. Okay. Um, can, right. Are you, can, you, can you share now? Or um... yep. I'll uh, I'll pop it up. Uh, just give me a second here, and I'll go to a full screen. Oops. Okay. Is everyone seeing that? Yep. That's good. Thank you. All right. Okay, so we'll get going. Uh, first off, thanks Chrissy and thanks to uh, the EDXC for inviting uh, me to come and uh, talk to you about the Canadian International DX Club and a little bit about the situation with uh, radio clubs and the hobby here in, in North America. Um, the name of our organization says a lot, uh, Canadian International DX Club. Uh, many people think you got you have to be a Canadian to participate or to join, and that's far from the truth. We we have welcomed people from all over the world into our membership. Membership has peaked and and dropped over the years. Uh, right now we're at about 200 members, a uh, little over 200 members. The majority being in Canada and the United States, but we do have. Uh, some members in Europe, uh, some in Japan, Australia, and uh, we've been getting a lot of inquiries from a few other parts of the world recently, and I'll explain why that's been happening uh, as we go through the presentation. So uh, this is a club banner that I've put up that um, our Vice President Mickey Delmage, his, uh, his late wife uh, many years ago, uh, handmade these banners. We have two of them um, and we use them at various exhibits and conferences and what have you. Um, you see the sign wave at the bottom of it uh, and our, our half maple leaf emblem that we use for our club. So this is the banner that uh, that Doris uh, Delmage had made for us and uh, it's uh, nice to have it uh, as, a, as a memorial to her as well. Uh, so we, we do uh, publicize this quite nicely at different events that we go to. So uh, the Canadian International DX Club, it was formed in 1962 here in Canada. It started in Winnipeg, Manitoba. That's the central province in Canada. And um, it's moved around over the years. It is presently has two headquarters, uh, one here in the Montreal region in the province of Quebec in Eastern Canada and out in Sherwood Park, Alberta, which is in the Western province of Alberta, up uh, close to Edmonton, the, uh, the provincial capital. Uh, we're not pro not for profit volunteer staffed organization. And uh, we are a general coverage club. We're not just a shortwave club. We pretty much cover DC to daylight, um, everything that we can. We keep expanding, adding new things. Uh, we've been fortunate enough to have a, a lot of, uh, you know, very dedicated uh, column editors and um, 
we've been able, because of that, been able to, to uh, stretch out our coverage uh, in our bulletin. Our bulletin is called The Messenger, and uh, we'll be talking about that as we go along throughout the, uh, the presentation here this morning. Um, all of our material, well, I should mention our messenger is an electronic newsletter. We were probably one of the first of the radio clubs to decide to go electronic only. We did it way back in February of 2005. And um, it, I wish it would have happened a long time before that because we, we went through the, the years and years of putting together and assembling uh, hard copy bulletins, the cost of production, photocopying, mailing costs, all of that. Um, when we made our switch to electronic, um, we nicely only lost two of our members um, who said to us, yeah, we don't have computers and we don't have printers at this time, and, uh, but we understand the decision that you've made and they were, they were okay with it. So uh, we got over that hurdle quite nicely and uh, we've been doing uh, electronic only ever since. And uh, it really opened up all kinds of new doors for us, the ability to do so many different things with our bulletin and the, the, the production of it is now so much easier as well. So um, we do permit anyone to use material from our bulletin uh, in other publications, as long as uh, full recognition and, and credit is provided uh, to CIDX, to the column editor, and to the originating source of the material, if different than the column editor. So whatever you see in the bulletin, you know, if you want to take something from it and use it, as long as you credit it, we don't have a problem with that. So. Canada is a very large country. Um, if you've got a flat map on the wall, it's that big pink thing up in the top left-hand corner of your map, usually. Uh, most of our population in Canada lives within about a 200 mile wide strip across the bottom of the country, just north of the US border. Uh, the rest of it is kind of just lots of open space and not many people up there. We're about 35 million people in Canada. We've put the two markers on the map here just to show you where our CIDX headquarters are, one here in Montreal region and the other one out here in Sherwood Park, Alberta, which is a, a sort of a suburb of uh, the city of Edmonton. So there's a lot of space between us. I think it's something like a 28 hour drive if you were to drive from, from Montreal to, uh, to Edmonton and something like a four hour flight. So Canada is a pretty wide country with a lot of open space. So th this is our rogues gallery of our, our column editors and our executives. So uh, this is me up here, uh, CIDX president and also editor of a column that we called uh, Not Just Listening. Uh, Mickey Delmage is our vice president. He's our very interesting editor. That is our QSL column. Mickey's here with us today. Uh, he can maybe uh, say hello to us. Um, uh, we'll, we'll introduce those guys a bit later, I guess. I should say, is in Sherwood Park, Alberta. Uh, Nigel Pimblett does our broadcast band column. He's also one of our vice presidents, and he's located in Alberta, southeastern Alberta, near the city of Medicine Hat. Uh, Don Momen is our executive secretary. He's uh, been with CIDX for a very long time. He's located in uh, Lamont, Alberta, also not too far from Edmonton. David Ross in Hamilton, Ontario, is our shortwave logbook editor. Eric Cottrell does our ham radio column, which is called Ham Radio Muse and News. He is located in Lynn, Massachusetts in the United States. We have Glenn Hauser. I'm sure all of you know Glenn Hauser. He is, uh, edits the DX program guide for us, and he's in Enid, Oklahoma. Chris Lobdell does our pirate radio column, which is called the Free Radio Scene. He is down in uh, Massachusetts, Tewksbury, Massachusetts. We have a column dedicated to uh, podcasts and uh, John Filiosi in um, near Albany, New York is our editor for the uh, Potting Along column. Uh, Gilles Letourneau is our utilities editor. He's based here in Montreal. Some of you may know him from his official SWL channel on YouTube and we'll talk a little bit more about that in a bit. And finally, Brian Penny is our uh, 
one of our newer columns called Radio Basics. It's sort of taking everybody back to square one. And uh, it aims, it's targeted at newcomers to the hobby, plus sort of a refresher course on all things radio related for all of us. You know, sometimes we forget things and it's nice to be reminded of things. So we set up a column uh, that deals with the basics. So that gives you an idea of the coverage. Uh, uh, you know, ham, we've had a ham radio column for many, many years, uh, something that not too many people do. We do have a couple other columns that are sort of catch-alls, which I'll talk about in a, in a couple minutes, uh, which don't specifically have a, a single editor. Our membership, and this was something that uh, came about when we made our change to electronic only. We had been charging a membership fee of $25 a year US or $32 a year Canadian for a one year membership. When we switched to an electronic bulletin, our costs were practically eliminated. Printing costs and mailing costs allowed us to bring our membership down to a mere $10 a year. Uh, and that's just to cover a basic, couple basic expenses that the club has. So we, uh, we have a $10 a year Canadian or US and we have a three-year special that we offer for $25 a year Canadian or US. And it's the same price for uh, members anywhere else in the world, $10 US or Canadian, three years for $25 US or Canadian. We accept PayPal or checks mailed to us. We don't accept credit cards or anything like that for uh, majority of our members are using the PayPal account. It's the most convenient, uh, so that works very well. Um, email address. Our web page is under construction. We're doing a new web page. We had a, a one running for quite some time, but we had some problems with it. We decided to make a, a, a fairly dramatic change to it. So that'll be coming up shortly. We have a Facebook group. Um, if you just look for Canadian International DX Club, you'll find it. Um, we'll make these all of these links available to everybody. And uh, we have an IO group, uh, which is uh, open to anybody as well for exchange of information. And that is our mailing address. Our, our headquarters is based in Quebec, which is my location uh, near Montreal. And uh, membership database and all of that is handled through here as well. So this is what our bulletin looks like. On uh, This is our November issue that just went out uh, a week or two ago. Um, front cover. Uh, look inside the typical monthly bulletin. We have no page limits because it's electronic. We've gone over a hundred pages a couple times. Normally we're somewhere six between 60 to 80 pages every month. It's a PDF format emailed to all of our members, usually in the first week of each month. I mentioned we are general coverage. So we have columns devoted to AM, FM, shortwave broadcast, utilities, QSLs, station schedules, DX programs, technical topics, podcasts, amateur radio, pirate broadcasting, basics of radio, propagation reviews and forecasts, and a whole bunch more, whatever we can throw in there. Uh, so it varies quite dramatically from month to month with material that I think is of interest to anyone, anywhere. Um, it We do carry a fair amount of Canadian information and North American information because of our largest membership base being there but there is an awful lot of material that's international so i think it would be of interest to just about anyone so if we look quickly at what you'll see uh in the bulletin every month we start off with a headquarters report which i put together um, it details upcoming special events we have free classified ads for cidx members special offers that we have. We do uh, make a World Radio TV Handbook, for example, available to our members at a special club price. Uh, so that all of that information goes into the headquarters report. The board of directors report is the latest information on anything going on within the organization. Um, so that is uh, just, I write it up every month uh, based on whatever's going on. We publicized this particular meeting, uh, the EDXC meeting in that column uh, in early November. So that's why we probably have a good number of uh, North Americans in here today is with us as well. Radio Basics by Brian Penny is uh, addressing questions that beginners to the hobby 
may have and offering tips and references and suggestions uh, for all of us. Um, you know, new things that are going on and looking back on some of the basics. The broadcast band column is uh, Nigel Pimblett's column. It's a monthly review of loggings and activity on long wave, medium wave, FM and TV bands. Um, and we do invite loggings from any of our members of uh, what they've been hearing. Um, very interesting is our QSL column uh, by Mickey Delmage. Um, we ask for people to send along their verifications that they receive. We break it down by AM, FM, TV, shortwave, utilities, amateur, and free radio uh, sections within the column. And we do welcome photos of your, of your QSLs that you've received as well, or letters. Uh, the World of Utilities is edited by Gilles Letourneau. This is a fairly, we didn't have a utilities column for quite some time and Jill took this on a little while ago and it's been very interesting, really uh, providing a lot of very detailed information about utilities. Uh, we're always hearing from so many people that there's nothing left on shortwave to listen to. Well, there's not only shortwave broadcast, there's a lot of other things that inhabit the, the bands and uh, so much of it is utility. So he looks at either voice transmissions or any of a variety of digital communications that are out there, what you can hear, frequencies, where to find them, what you'll need to receive and decode some of them that are not voice transmissions. And uh, he looks at publications, web resources to help you identify and uh, looks at software equipment that's available out there as well. So it's a really nice catch all for the world of utilities. Uh, one column that's been dormant for a little while is an Arctic and Antarctic DX. Uh, John Reisner has been the editor of that for quite a while. He's kind of taken a break right now, so it's not appearing in the bulletin, but um, it's quite unique. It goes back with CIDX for a very long time. It was created by a gentleman named Bob Curtis many years ago uh, who lived in Vermont. It features any type of radioactivity north of 60 degrees north. Uh, and also in the Antarctic areas. So uh, broadcasts, utilities, amateur radio activities, loggings, QSLs, feature articles, anything going on in the Arctic and Antarctic regions of the planet. So it's uh, quite a unique thing. We hope we can get uh, John back up and active with that again shortly. The shortwave logbook is pretty well self-explanatory. It's the list of uh, loggings submitted by uh, members. Uh, country, station, frequency, time, details of each logging. The free radio scene, edited by Chris Lobdell, uh, features loggings, QSL information, station profiles, uh, insight into the free radio pirate radio scene, which is extremely active here in North America and in, in Europe. Um, a lot of our information in that column is America or North American based, but we certainly welcome input from elsewhere. Uh, Glenn Hauser's World of Radio and uh, the DX program guide. Uh, the World of Radio is a collection of sources of information relating to radio, uh, particularly shortwave, and it does have links to his publications and his broadcasts of World of Radio. Um, we have one column called Station Shortwave Station Resources which is more or less listings of, of URLs or links to websites that give you times, frequencies, schedules of stations on shortwave that you can use to help you uh, surf around the bands and find who's where and what frequencies they're on and what times the broadcasts are on and that sort of thing. Um, the DX program guide is something that Glenn produces on his own World of Radio website, but we do reproduce it in our bulletin. It's a monthly updated list of DX, SWL, and media programs available on shortwave and through a few other sources as well. Not Just Listening is a fairly new column as well. I edit this one. It's, uh, it's exactly that. You don't necessarily just listen. We put in links to films, TV shows, documentaries, books, videos, and other sources of material that have a common theme, and that theme is radio. 
So uh, some really interesting stuff that you'll find in there. If you're looking to uh, go and watch something on YouTube, if you're looking at a movie that's maybe available in the public domain that has radio as a theme, uh, books that are available, some of them electronically available for free that you can read. So it's not just listening, but it's lots of other things to do with radio. Podding Along is the podcast column that John Filiosi puts together. Uh, it's his subjective list and guide of, of podcasts that he's enjoyed that he thinks uh, members of CIDX might enjoy as well. So it's a little bit of a description of the podcast and a link directly to each individual podcast. Technical Talks is kind of open-ended as far as editorship. It's uh, technical art articles that we come across, equipment reviews, modifications, antenna designs, projects and uh, updates in technology. And we'll also answer any questions that people may have on the technical side of, of what we do. Ham Radio Muse and News, the editor is Eric Cottrell. He's a ham radio operator in Massachusetts. Um, anything ham radio related, we do accept loggings as well, but we have all the upcoming contests, special event stations, uh, developments in ham radio. Uh, DX tips, um, anything ham radio related. News and notes is a, a gathering of miscellaneous stuff that we really don't know where else to put. <laughs> it just uh, little things of interest, uh, station schedules or special programs that other stations have advised, uh, advised us on and we want to get the information out to our people. Um, stories coming from lots of different sources from CIDX members and other friends of CIDX. The What's News column is uh, newspaper articles, magazine articles, feature stories uh, from the internet, from blogs and other sources that have radio uh, as a theme, obviously. And finally, the propagation report, which we pick up from Natural Resources Canada's Space Weather webpage. It looks at the last month's worth of activity, so a review of what happened over last month, and it gives a forecast for the next three to four weeks of what people can expect propagation wise. And this all comes from a government uh, uh, space weather website that we have here in Canada. So that's the basic content of our bulletin. So what else does CIDX have to offer to its members? There's some interesting things. So we'll wrap this up by going over what those are. We have our Facebook group. Um, it's um, you just have to go to Facebook, look for see if it's in um, you don't necessarily have to be a CIDX paid member uh, to become a member of the Facebook group. You'll find on it up to date information on events in the club, breaking news, DX tips, and people invited to post up whatever they like, uh, share photographs, ask questions, interact with other members. We have an IO group, which is very similar to the Facebook page, um, online gathering place for members with internet capability. We have monthly Zoom meetings, um, generally once a month. We've been holding them normally on Saturday afternoons, the third Saturday of each month, 1700 UTC. Details of each uh, upcoming meeting appear in the messenger. Again, any they're open to uh, other people as well. Predominantly, though, we've been having CIDX members participate in these. In Montreal, we have two annual events, uh, which were obviously didn't happen for the last uh, year or so because of COVID. But we usually hold an annual uh, summer barbecue in Montreal at the Montreal headquarters, which is here in my backyard. And uh, we have an annual Christmas dinner as well at around the Christmas period at a local restaurant here in Montreal. And we invite any of our members anywhere else to you know, gather people together and, and have an event and tag it by it with CIDX if they wish to do so as well. Uh, we have a fairly good strong chapter of members down in the Boston area and we do get uh, participate with them on a few things on some of their Zooms and what have you. So. Uh, Basically, anyone's open within our membership to have a little chapter within their own city or town, wherever they may be, and see if they can find some other people in their local area who uh, want to get together. 
CIDX on the air and online. Uh, myself and Jill Letourneau co-host a weekly radio show in Montreal. It's on a campus community radio station connected to McGill University in Montreal. It's called the International Radio Report. It's been on the air weekly since November of 1987. So a very long time. Um, Sunday mornings at 1530 UTC. And uh, it's available live streaming or archived at the radio station's website, ckut.ca. It's 30 minutes of news and views on the world of radio broadcasting. So anything related to radio, we gather information up every week and uh, put it together in a 30 minute show. Um, we also have a Facebook group for the radio program and you can go and listen to the shows when it's convenient for you by going to our YouTube channel, uh, which is International Radio Report. You'll hear the latest show plus previous shows that are archived on that site. Uh, that's becoming the most popular access point for people to listen to the show. Um, the website at CKUT Radio, sometimes the live streaming doesn't work that well. Uh, so the most uh, reliable way to listen to our program is to listen to it through the YouTube channel. Uh, it's usually, each show is posted up generally within an hour after the show actually airs on the radio. During COVID, we've actually been pre-recording the show. Uh, Jill has a studio in his home where he records, we record the show on Friday afternoons. We upload it to the computer at the radio station and it goes to air on Sunday mornings, uh, local time in Montreal, uh, 1530 UTC. So um, you have several ways that you can tune in and, uh, and listen to it. Um, I also publish uh, something called the Radio HF Internet Newsletter, uh, which has been going for many, many years. It's a listing every month sent out uh, to subscribers. There's no fee for this. It lists all sorts of websites uh, dealing with radio, communications, telecommunications, uh, radio memorabilia, collectibles, and then we branch out into other areas of interest as well. We have about 1,500 subscribers to that every month, and um, it's uh, sent out in a, um, a PDF form uh, to everyone every month. And if you are a CADX member, we automatically send this to you um, as uh, a part of your membership, but it is available to anyone, anywhere, uh, simply by writing to hfnewsletter at yahoo.com and we put you onto the mailing list for that. It is available as well through an IO group, uh, so you can go and look at back copies of it there as well. And uh, to wrap up, if you would like a free sample of our messenger, uh, all you need to do is send us an email, cidxclub at yahoo.com. We will only issue one free copy per person. We've had some people try to send us a, an email a month saying, please send me a copy of your bulletin. Well, we keep track of all of those. So we do only send one freebie out. Um, and if you want to receive it, uh, want to become a member, and we certainly hope you will. Uh, you know, the fee is very inexpensive and uh, you get onto the membership list and uh, receive all the, uh, the, the monthly bulletins uh, in your inbox every month. So I think that's my last slide. Yes, it is. So I'll stop sharing. And I'm certainly open to any questions that people may have. I'm going to make, uh, I guess, Chrissy, maybe I can make the all of those contacts and links and that available to you. And if you anybody wants them, they can, uh, you could distribute it to them. Yeah, that, that's very good. Yeah, thank you, Sheldon. I'll send it out to everybody. Or I can just put a, a post on our on the EDXC website as well. Um, okay. If there's anything you want to send us, so we can share that. Okay. Thank you very okay. much. Okay. So if any if anyone has any questions or uh, that they'd like to ask, uh, now we could certainly take a few minutes and answer any questions you might have. I guess you could. One thing I would say, uh, Sheldon, um, you know, I was a member of CIDX back in the mid 80s when I was associated with um, Anarch. And when I got back in the hobby, I went on ahead and looked around and joined all the clubs 
that were still in business after Anart broke up. And I'm pleased to say that CIDX was one of them. And for the money, CIDX is a bargain. Um, the bulletin is great. I won't say I read it cover to cover every month, but I certainly spend some time going through and looking at it. So if you're not a member, if you'd be in the, the least bit interested, go on ahead and, and send Sheldon an email and ask for a copy of um, the bulletin. Um, even if you don't join, uh, you'll have an idea of the, the quality of the work that CIDX does. And I think even if you don't join, you'll see that uh, $10 a year uh, Canadian or US is a small price to pay for the, the quality of the product. Your, uh, your commission check will be in the mail, uh, Terry. <laughs> Good. It, You're it our sales be, agent there. <laughs> it better be pretty large. Uh, you know, I'm charging you by the second. There you go. So, yeah. But anyway, yeah. Uh, I, just thought I'd, I just thought I'd mention that. You know, I belong to all the North American clubs. And, you know, I think in terms of the balance the 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 mix of information in the bulletin um cidx is far and away the the best of the of the field well thank you very much for that terry um mickey uh, i see you're on there mickey's uh, and nigel two of our vice presidents are here uh, mick you want to say a couple words yeah, good, good morning good afternoon good evening wherever you may be um my uh, day started uh, the lyrics of a day in the life of the Beatles. I actually woke up at 1500, uh, which is 8, 8 a.m. here. The sun is just coming up and uh, <laughs> fell out of bed, dragged the comb through this mop, and then uh, ran in to grab a cup. And that's where things went wrong. The coffee maker had a major failure. 100% operator uh, <laughs> problem. <laughs> so I've got that cleaned up. I'm here. Good, good day, everyone. It's great to see everyone. Uh, like uh, Sheldon uh, mentioned earlier, I'm just outside the capital city of Edmonton, uh, Alberta, which uh, for all you footy fans, we had a big match here last night between Canada and Costa Rica. And uh, at game time, the temperature was zero Celsius. So uh, the Costa Ricans got introduced to uh, northern uh, or central Alberta weather in November. And uh, and lost the game, so go Canada. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I'm the editor of the very interesting uh, QSL column uh, for uh, highlighting all the goodies that uh, members get uh, in the mail um, and uh, online now with the EQSLs uh, month to month. And um, I've been doing that uh, that column for a long time. I think I've been doing a column for CIDX since about 1984. So. Um, yeah, I, I am old. <laughs> yeah, so anyway, good to see you all and uh, hope to meet some of you in person again when we when we're allowed to, uh, to do this uh, travel again. But uh, right now that uh, that's not uh, not going to happen. Yeah, thank, thank you. I just that's a good opportunity for me to plug the um, European, European DX Council conference, which um, we were hoping to have in Bucharest last year and then put it over to this year. And obviously, with COVID, that wasn't going to happen. So at the moment, we're looking, um, well, we scheduled it for May of 2022 in Romania. Um, and we'll just update people as we go. But Hopefully, we will be able to meet and people will feel comfortable in meeting. So um, you can follow details on that uh, on the EDXC blog. And I'll obviously send emails out and start publicizing it near the time. Christian, who is here with us, has um, been organizing most of that. And we were hoping originally, and hopefully it will still happen, um, to include a tour of Radio Romania International. 
Um, each year I worry because <laughs> it's obviously still on shortwave at the moment, but a couple of years ago we thought you better get there quickly whilst they're still on the air. So hopefully they will still be that there for us. And we're hoping to also to get to a transmitter site. But again, a lot of things with COVID restrictions, we just don't know yet, but um, fingers crossed for that. Excellent. Yeah, that'd be great. We're we're hoping to uh, to do a convention um, for CIDX in 2022 as well. We're hoping to do it out in in Edmonton. Um, we've tried to do conventions once every five years to mark a, you know every fifth anniversary of CIDX. Uh, so we're hoping to try to get one done in uh, in 2022 as well. So uh, that uh, that's in the plans for for the future. Um, so yeah, that's that's about it. I mean, if if any of you guys out there that are involved in your clubs and your publications, and you have any questions about how we do what we do with our publication, again, feel free to contact us. And uh, you know, we we don't have any secrets. Uh, we've we've managed to figure out how to get it done quite well electronically. It uh, it all magically comes together very nicely every month. So uh, if, you, if you're uh, looking for any tips on any of that, as I said, we've been doing it since 2005. And, um, you know, what we're able to do electronically now compared to the old uh, manual hard copies is just like, you know, you look back at those days and it's like Stone Age compared to what we're able to do now. So um, I see a hand raised from uh, Sudipta. Uh, do you have a question? I'm not yeah. sure. Oh, his mic is is muted. Uh, maybe. Unmute. Oh, there he is. Uh, uh, I am uh, associated with this Indian DX Club International in India. Uh, I find that you are uh, publishing uh, about hundred or more pages, uh, as you have told me. Told the meeting, the meeting. Uh, how to uh, should be a very big fight. We are uh, to uh, limit our uh, publications to 30 to 35. Okay, your your internet connection was breaking up quite badly. Um, I think you're asking something about the size of the file uh, with with having a you know a very uh, large bulletin. It is it is sent in a PDF, so it does compact uh, you know fairly easily. Although I'm sure with internet connections, some people you know in some parts of the world it might be difficult to uh, uh, to get hold of it. But um, that's what we're doing. We do send it out in a PDF, so. Um, that's that's the only way it is available, uh, and it is sent out by email. So um, I'm not sure if that answers the question. But uh, do you uh, do you have any uh, uh, size of the file in mind when you post it on your website? <laughs> Well, we don't we don't post the bulletin on the website. It's not available through our website. It's only available to members uh, by email each month, or in a free sample one one free sample per per request, uh, uh, which we send by email. So the 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 bulletins are not archived on our website at all. Oh. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. All right. All right. Yeah. Okay, Chrissy, if uh, I don't know, I didn't check the chat. I don't know if there are any questions in the chat. I can do that. No, but could I just ask, well, I, I'm a big fan of the International Radio Report, and I know a lot of people in Europe who listen as well. Um, right. That must take a lot of putting together. Is, is, that, is, it, is there much of an overlap between that and the information you, you, go, you go to press with, or not print, but put in the bulletin? <laughs> Well, there, there is some crossover material. I mean, some of the material we do put into the bulletin uh, from the show. The show kind of, you know, we've been doing it for so long. I, I actually started the show um, at CKUT Radio in 1987 when the station got its FM license. 
and we're one of only two shows that's been at the station since day one. Um, so it's been going since 1987. Since we've been doing it electronically, uh, well, pre-recording the show, previous to COVID, we were actually going to the studio Sunday mornings doing the show live. Uh, we doubt that we'll ever do that again uh, because of the ease and convenience of pre-recording. Uh, we can we can change the content up until basically as late as Saturday evening and upload the latest version of the show to the to the CKUT computer uh, remotely. So we can you know we can make last minute changes if we need to. What we've been doing up to now is pre-recording it on Friday and sending it in uh, to the computer. Putting it together is kind of a job between Jill and myself. We just keep an open file during the week and pull in stuff that we come across throughout the week or stuff that people have sent in either on the Facebook page or sent to us directly. And we just kind of, you know, we work really well together and we kind of throw it together and it just seems to fit into 30 minutes. Uh -huh. I know some people have said to us, well, you know, you guys should do an hour. Well, some weeks you wouldn't have enough material to fill an hour and then other weeks, you know, we have too much for the for the half hour where we could go over, but we just don't have we have a half hour time slot and that's it. And producing trying to produce an hour every week would be, you know, double the work, obviously. So uh, I think the 30 minutes is good. It's uh, we've got it into a, uh, a routine now that works very well for both of us. And, um, you know, it's it, it, it all came it all comes together. And uh, I think it's done a lot to really bring a lot of new people uh, to, to radio monitoring. Uh, we have some people who listen to us locally here in Montreal. They have no clue what we're talking about in half the show where, where we're talking about international shortwave stuff and whatever. And they, but they like the show itself, just you know, our comments, our, our interaction between us and what have you. So it's, um, it's attracted people that are not just shortwave listeners and DXers. So it's a good publicity vehicle, as is uh, Gilles' uh, official SWL channel. He has solely been responsible, I think, for bringing us so many new members into CIDX over the last year or two, and so many new people to the radio hobby. I don't think any of us would have dreamed of people contacting us today and asking for advice on buying their very first shortwave radio. And that happens almost every single time that Jill does one of his transmissions on his shows on YouTube. Um, I don't know where these people have been. I, we don't know who they are. We don't know what they're doing. The questions that they're asking are the questions that we were asking 30, 40 years ago. Uh, it's almost like a rebirth and uh, it's really encouraging. And that's what's happening here in North America. I hope it's happening in other places as well. Uh, but uh, we're seeing so many new people, you know, getting curious about what this is all about. SDRs obviously have opened up the world to a lot of people as well. Um, so there's a lot going on out there. You know, we hear so much negative about, you know, clubs that have folded and, and there's nothing to listen to and radio's dying and all this stuff that keeps flying around. Um, if people really start looking and, and, you know, there's sources of information out there for them, I think there's still a lot of life left in what we do. Yeah, I'd, I'd agree with that. That's really encouraging to hear that you're almost accidentally getting to new audiences. I guess that's the way to go. Just put stuff out there and hope new people pick it up and they clearly are. Thank you very much, Sheldon. Um, Mika, can we turn to you now? Are you okay to give your presentation? Sure, yeah, we can, we can start right off. Um, I don't have a slideshow for you, but I'll be teasing you with some photos so you don't have to stare at me all the time. Mm -hmm. um, Happy to see you, so many of you all around the world. Um, we're uh, listening to AM stations up in North Finland from uh, probably all of your countries. Uh, I just came back from Lapland a couple of weeks ago. And um, first of all, I'll sort of, sort of give you an introduction as to what, uh, how the hobby has developed in, in uh, our country and in our circles and, and with this us personally, so that we've uh, come to the uh, 
conclusion of setting up perhaps the best equipped DX in, AMDX base in the entire world. Uh, so the DXing base is called Aikiniem. It's located in northern Finland, and pretty soon I'll, I'll go into the details of it. But uh, I'll, I'll, I'd first just say that it uh, it uh, started with um, us uh, focusing pretty much on shortwave. But uh, as you as you know, it didn't take many years for most of us uh, leading DXs in Finland to get. Uh, pretty much all the shortwave radio stations uh, picked up and verified. And so most of us, uh, the interest uh, has focused on, on, uh, on AM stations since then. And, um, and also, well, you, te you tend to get quite a lot of AM stations pretty uh, quickly as well. And, and uh, so we've tried to improve the odds of picking up new stations all the time, which has led us to establish specific D expedition bases up in northern Finland, Lapland, where there's plenty of space for huge antennas. And uh, just to show you where Aikinem is located. So here's Finland over here. Uh, the Arctic Circle goes roughly over here. 400 kilometers north of the Arctic Circle, we can see this pretty big lake, Lake Inari. And uh, uh, on the northern edge of Lake Inari, we find Aikiniemi. If you try to Google it, you won't find it because it's not really a name of a city or a town or even a village. It's it's the name of our property, and uh, we sort of christened. We found that uh, Aikiniemi name in the old uh, uh, land records of that area, and so we adopted that as our as our that's the name of our base. Uh, Here's another map to show where Aikinim is located in the very northern tip of Finland. Uh, for AM reception, it actually would be better to be located on, on the coast, uh, as you well know. So the Norwegian DXs have a bit of an advantage when, uh, uh, for instance, the Kongsfjord AM DX base is located right up here. We visited that place a few weeks ago as well. This is what Aikinim looks like. Uh, this is actually not the first AMDX base uh, that's built in Finland. We used to have this DX base called Lemmenjoki, Love River, actually from quite a long time ago, from the 1980s already. And I've been DXing in Lemmenjoki for probably 20 times. So I've spent almost a year in Lemmenjoki. Um, but the problem with that area is that the uh, it was just too popular. There were too many of us. We couldn't DX in Lemmenjoki as much as we wanted to. And also uh, summer cabins began to pop up uh, in the surrounding areas. And uh, there was a growing amount of uh, radio frequency interference. And so we started looking for a second, uh, second base, at the perfect location for an entirely interference-free AMDX base. And we tested several locations up in Lapland, set up a beverage antenna and uh, tested how quiet they are. And uh, eventually we found this one spot, uh, the, this property was on sale. Uh, we tested it, it uh, uh, sounded really nice. Uh, the location was pretty good. It was close to a major road. It, it's got electricity. There's really just one neighbor and uh, a very quiet place. So we actually bought the property. We formed an association, not like a registered DX association, like the Finnish DX association, but more like a uh, informal group of eight, eight DXs who, who uh, came together and uh, bought this place. And we, most of the surrounding forests, uh, that's a, the, uh, Basis a few hectares, but for our beverage antennas, we would naturally need a much larger area, actually a couple of square kilometers, so hundreds of hectares. And uh, most of that area, forests around Aikinem, is owned by the state. And we rented it. Uh, we rented it uh, for the use of our antennas. So we don't really use it for any other purpose than the antennas. It's a multi-use area. The government can still, uh, they can, uh, you know, uh, cut the trees if they want to, or half of it, the uh, reindeer can still freely uh, roam in the area and so forth. So we don't, we are not paying uh, terribly much money for, for that privilege. Um, 
here you can see uh, this brown cabin is the first one that we would built in uh, uh, 2010, 11 years ago. And that's got a listening room in the one end, a uh, room for sleeping in the other end, and a toilet in between. The second cabin we added uh, a year ago. It's got a sauna, so now we have washing facilities. It's got a kitchen and uh, uh, a small storage, and also uh, enough space for like a small dining area and one bed. So now it's uh, able to accommodate, uh, I'd say, th max three people at a time, but only two DXs at a time. The listening room is uh, uh, not, not, not that big. The surroundings is really uh, beautiful. It's an, it's an Arctic forest. Uh, in the winter, we get a lot of snow. Uh, but it's also it's still close to a major road, so we don't, we are not we're never stuck there. I mean, we can always it it it's maintained year round, and we can always get in and out. It's not a problem. Also, we have a, uh, a cell phone tower very nearby, so we got fast internet connection, 50 megabytes per second. We can work remotely from here, which is something that I've taken advantage of during this uh, pandemic period. A drone shot from the above. This is what it looks like during the fall colors. Uh, it's located uh, close to a small lake. Actually, the area is dotted by uh, tiny bodies of water, which can be a bit of a problem in, uh, for, for the antennas. Uh, but that's the landscape is what it is. We can't really, really affect it. Uh, we have quite a, an impressive arsenal of uh, beverage antennas. It's, it's probably the biggest in the world. Uh, there's uh, 14 antennas. Each of these are a minimum of 800 meters in length and a maximum of 1,200 meters in length. Uh, so on, on average, one kilometer. And uh, in this Lapland centered map, you can see the azimuth, the angle uh, uh, of each, each antenna. And we pretty much cover the world because uh, if, if you think of where the largest amount of AM stations uh, can be found, uh, it's, of course, Latin America, North America, and East Asia. Uh, European stations, stations from the Middle East, we consider more of a nuisance, not that much of a DX target, uh, except for the really low power stations in, uh, in some countries like the Netherlands. Africa, unfortunately, is pretty devoid of AM broadcasting nowadays, so there's not that... Uh, much to listen to. There's only uh, extensive AM networks in, in a few countries like uh, Nigeria, Ethiopia, Mozambique, uh, to name a few. Uh, so that's what it looks like. Um, let's see. <clears throat> Uh, the antenna, so they are they, they're basically wire antennas. Uh, we we need to keep them pretty high up, uh, like three to five meters above ground. And that's because we have a lot of reindeer in the area. It's the traditional uh, uh, way of survival uh, for the Sami indigenous people up in Lapland. And uh, we don't, of course, want to interfere with their lifestyle. And also we got a lot of moose. Uh, we don't want to get uh, any, we don't want to capture any moose either. So the problem uh, over the winter is to uh, keep the antennas clean of snow and ice. And we'll have to like uh, here. There's a friend of mine, Jim Solatia, uh, cleaning cleaning the antennas, dropping the ice and snow off the antennas. Uh, uh, I think the photo was taken one or two years ago. Uh, here's a drone shot uh, that uh, shows what the landscape looks like. Uh, the cabin is located over here. So we need quite a long uh, coax feed to most of the antennas. Some of the antennas are, 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 are not shown over here. They are more to the uh, down right the hand corner of, of the photo. But most of the antennas you see here, and uh, so we carefully uh, uh, had to choose the uh, sort of to uh, avoid avoid the uh, small ponds and lakes and and try to figure out how to extend the antennas to one kilometer. You can see that the area is actually very flat, uh, except for one hill, uh, roughly at the point where I've taken the shot, uh, which is nice. Uh, but it's also, uh, you, uh, as you can derive from the photo, it's a, it's a very swampy area, 
which tends to be a bit of a problem uh, before the winter time when when it gets frozen. So it, it's it's actually quite challenging to uh, walk in and uh, walk around and, and check the antennas. It's uh, I, for 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 hiking or whatever other purpose it, uh, I I could think of a few better uh, surroundings. This is what it looks uh, from the inside. This is the listening room. And uh, basically what we see here, first of all, here's like a, a setup where all the uh, coax cables come in from uh, outside the cabin. And uh, here we have coax fire uh, wires going through uh, to an to antenna uh, uh, boxes, which divide the antennas for both listeners. So we bo both listeners have access to all the 14 beverage antennas. Uh, and uh, nowadays, most listeners tend to use SDR type receivers. So they are just these tiny boxes. You can, I don't know if you can even see any of these. There's a, somehow buried somewhere here. Okay, here's one pair sales receiver over here. And uh, so, uh, uh, Perseus is actually the most popular receiver because um, uh, the famous uh, AMDXing software Jaguar can only be used with a Perseus receiver. And of course, if Perseus also has the advantage of uh, uh, being a very good receiver and covering the entire AM band. So like my setup usually is three laptops, uh, three Perseus receivers. Uh, that I uh, that are connected to the 14 different antennas. So at, at one particular point, I can use a maximum of three beverage antennas uh, pointing to three different directions and, and record the entire AM band with all of them. Uh, here, here's a closer up shot. Uh, there you see one of the Perseus receivers, uh, uh, external hard drives uh, for recording all this stuff, of course, takes quite a lot of hard drive space. I usually spend like uh, at least 10 terabytes per week. Uh, so like now that I returned from Lapland, I, I think I had like 25 terabytes of recordings uh, to check uh, some future date, maybe when I retire or <laughs> who knows when I have the time for it. And of course, if, if the uh, uh, sun is not favorable at least we get a uh, uh, bit of a show outside and, and and can enjoy the northern lights and uh, uh, this was a lucky shot we i even got uh, a shooting star in the same uh, same shot and uh, uh, unfortunately at this time of the year the uh, uh, it tends to be pretty over uh, the clouds are uh, often uh, ruining the uh, uh, scenery and uh, a lot of overcast nights. And uh, so sometimes during geomagnetic storms, we don't really get to see the light show at its best. But uh, I usually come uh, from Lapland with a bunch of uh, uh, photos of Aurora Borealis. So that's another advantage of being, uh, being up there in the north. Uh, DXing.info may be a familiar website to some of you. It's uh, not affiliated with any DX club. It's, it's maintained by me. And this is where you find most of the IFKDM and expedition reports. And that's where I, I always post my personal reports, uh, such as this one, which uh, I made public just a few days ago. Uh, one interesting aspect uh, you can see over here, uh, one of these, uh, new antennas because we need uh, these long coax uh, feeds uh, we had to take to the other side of the main road and uh, <laughs> so uh, the, the only option is to, uh, to, to use these uh, culverts for um, uh, for rain rainwater and uh, luckily uh, I didn't get stuck in there I was able to uh, take the coax to the other side and uh, so we built a new antenna replacing one of the older antennas, which started gathering some interference. Uh, yeah, that's uh, that's pretty much it. We have we have a Feb, uh, Facebook group, Eichkinemi Clubhouse. It's uh, it's a closed secret group for only those who uh, use Eichkinemi. Uh, and uh, so, if you ever want to rent a week in Eichkinemi, you are granted a membership in, in this group. Uh, otherwise, I'd say that, you know, since most of the D expedition sites uh, are pretty restricted, you have to uh, 
you don't necessarily have access if if you are uh, so to speak an ordinary dx and but uh, in iceniemy we wanted to do things differently iceniemy is uh, basically open for anyone uh, we made huge investments in the place for instance last season uh, the new uh, uh, cabin and uh, new antennas and all the equipment cost us 30000 euros so we, it's it's not a cheap place. We try to recoup some of that investment through uh, renting the remaining weeks that are not used by us eight to other DXs. And so uh, right now the uh, cost for renting Eichkiniem is 800 euros per week. But uh, uh, we do get some uh, foreign visitors as well. We are going to have one one from the UK in a couple of months and and, and so forth and. Uh, it's it's really a bucket list experience uh, from uh, what I hear from DXs who don't normally have access to this kind of uh, beverage antennas. It's uh, it's it's a totally different experience. First of all, compared to anything that that you can imagine uh, in a in a on a more southern latitude, because up there in the north, the uh, geomagnetic field uh, disturbances really make a huge difference. You know. Uh, conditions very widely you can have really surprising openings uh, to a very narrow uh, target area um, uh, sometimes you can have north american stations 24 hours a day then you can have three days of basically zero reception from any wave there's a, like a major solar storm so it's it's really unexpected you can you're in for huge surprises always when you go up to lapland and it's an entirely different experience uh, to dx up in lapland uh, say compared to even southern finland let alone uh, compared to like central europe uh that's pretty much it i'm uh, open for questions what what would you like to know about Eichinevi? Mika, this is Bill Whitaker in the States. Uh -huh. I'm curious if someone is not interested in freezing to death or hearing North American stations, mm -hmm. what's a good time to come to Lapland? Uh, uh, well, uh, if you're not interested in DXing, it depends on what you want to do in Lapland. I mean, uh -oh. it, it... I want to DX. Oh, okay. I want to okay. DX yep. Asia, Africa. <laughs> Middle okay. East. I, I can hear North America pretty well from where I am right now. And yeah. I, yeah. <laughs> Well, it, it tends to uh, uh, vary a lot. I mean, we usually start our DXing season uh, early September. And uh, uh, in September tends to be like the best time of the year and consequently March and April for listening to like uh, Australian AM stations, which is like a really coveted target up here because they they tend to be sort of behind the Asian stations from our perspective and are, and are really difficult. For New Zealand stations, October, mid-October, I would say is the best season. But overall, the earlier in the fall you go or the later you go in, in the spring, the more you have, uh, re the better reception you have towards southern latitudes. So from the Eastern Hemisphere, uh, earlier timing tends to favor uh, areas like Australia, Thailand, India, and if you go later in the season, you tend to get more China, Japan, Korea. And consequently, on the Western hem Hemisphere, if, if you uh, go there late summer, early fall, you tend to get a lot of South American stations. And uh, later in the season, if there's no geomagnetic disturbances, you get a lot of North American stations. So. Uh, if you don't want to freeze to death and you don't uh, necessarily want to uh, need uh, need to hear North American stations, I would uh, suggest uh, September, early October, which tend to be uh, times that are uh, are pretty full, uh, fully booked already, though. And uh, and uh, on the other hand, then in the springtime, the same same roughly equal equal time, like late March. Would, would perhaps be the ideal time. There's a lot of snow in late March, though. Not in the snow. Sorry. Not in the snow. Thanks. <laughs> <laughs> then I'd say then I'd say September is is would be your choice. That, yeah. That would be good. That would work. Thank you. Uh, there's a couple of questions. I think Sheldon and Terry have raised their hands, and there's also a question in the chat. Okay. Let's uh, Sheldon go ahead. 
Yeah, uh, hi, Mika. Uh, thanks for the presentation. Really, really interesting setup you have there. I'm just curious, uh, do you have electricity there or are you using, do you have to use generator? Uh, we have electricity and it's it's pretty reliable. We sometimes get uh, blackouts which last like less than a second. And so that occasionally messes up uh, some pre-recording uh, schedules or, or such. That, but if you're listening live, it's not an issue. So yeah, I, we've never had like really long blackouts. Uh, also, we'd freeze to death if it wasn't for the electricity. We don't have a fireplace there. So <laughs> we're sort of dependent on them and counting on it to work. Yeah, I was curious, you're uh, uh, heating the buildings as well. Uh, how are you doing that? Yeah, that's uh, electricity. We've got uh, batteries in both buildings. Okay, very good. Thanks. It's really yeah. very, very interesting what you guys are doing there. Yeah. All right. Who's next? Uh, Stephen or Terry? Uh, go ahead. Hi, Mika. Hi. Uh, thank you very much. I was just had a quick question on uh, what gauge the wire is that you use for the antennas. Sorry, what? What gauge of wire do you use for your antennas? Um, uh, sorry, I'm not familiar with the term. So uh, do you mean like what uh, the, uh, the, the brand or the uh, diameter or? Diameter. Okay. It's equivalent to RG58, but RG58 tends to deteriorate in sunlight. So we use another brand. Uh, let me see if I can find, find it out for you. Um, I can't find it now immediately but anyway anyway there's like um, I think it's um, let me think is it UL wire that's uh, sold that is more resistant and also um, more resistant towards radio frequency interference than RG58 so but anyway roughly uh, equivalent to RG58 okay is that for the leads or the antennas themselves uh, for the leads yeah the antennas are just the uh, uh, sorry, the uh, yeah UL wire. I mean, sorry, that's yeah that refers to the antenna itself exactly. Yeah, so that's like the really uh, uh, um, it's not heavy at all. So it's it's kind of easy to use up up in that forest, even if you have like extended uh, areas without the support of the trees. Yeah, so that's where we've been trying to replace the older little bit heavier copper wire antennas with the, with the UL wire. It's also very uh, uh, sturdy in, in, in the sense that if, if it, something gets, uh, it, it's not easily breakable. Okay, thank you. Uh, who's next? Uh, just go ahead. Okay. Um, you know, I looked at the, at the picture you showed of the ice load. Mm -hmm on those antennas and you know i i heard your answer but i just wondered what gauge wire that is that can support that much ice you know i'm i'm used to ham radio antennas you know long wires dipoles whatever that at least in the parts of the u.s where there is a lot of snow you know that's a pretty thick antenna wire yeah it's uh I, i'd say that the, the weather changes often enough so that uh, and also we do check the antennas regularly so it's right. it's actually an obligation for anybody visiting Aichkinemi to go through the antennas and and drop the snow and ice but also every time it, you know it goes above zero all the snow and ice falls off and uh, right. and uh, we start off all over again and uh, we've never had the, the issue of uh, ice or snow breaking an antenna wire so far uh, the the second question i have how do you overcome signal loss with those long lengths of coax it would it would seem like you know because i've seen for you know all different kinds of coax mm -hmm. including the industrial grade uh, uh, coax um, you know the signal loss is quite high 
Yeah. And so do you, do you use amplifiers? Do you use anything associated with that coax to boost the signal? Yeah, we actually do use amplifiers and uh, it's uh, safe to amplify the signals quite a lot in, in the cabin because um, uh, there are no nearby stations, AM stations anywhere in the neighborhood that would cause the receivers to overload. So I think the nearest station is located in Svalbard and it's a three kilowatt station and uh, so not, not much of an issue. Okay, thank you. Uh, and, and by the way, um, I'll never do it, but th that location would certainly be on my bucket list if I had one. <laughs> okay, now, now I've got the specifics for the uh, coax cable here. It's uh, the brand that we use is Trilan, T-R-I-L-A-N 240PE, whatever that stands for. <laughs> Some of you know better than me what it is. And uh, so that costs like, uh, uh, almost a year euro per meter, but uh, and uh, like the latest antenna we added was we had to use 450 meters of coax, so it's not exactly cheap to build an antenna over there. And by the way, Don Moment just uh, uh, posted something in chat that everyone should read. I won't I won't read what he posted, but it's quite instructive about. Uh, the, the gauge wire and and also coax loss at mm -hmm. yeah. uh, medium wave frequency. Yeah, there's also a question, how do you route the coax feeders round or through the lake spawns? Yeah, we, we sort of designed the, uh, 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 the, the routes over, you know, based on a map so that we can avoid the, uh, the, the lakes and ponds, and, but they, they are very uh, straight, very direct. We don't, we don't allow, uh, uh, we don't allow, you know, it to wiggle left or right too many, too many degrees, otherwise it won't work as, as planned. I'll, in the chat, I'll uh, add the, uh, precise uh, uh, brand coax that, that we are, we've been using, if anybody is interested. How close are you to uh, Marty and the group Arkala OH8X? Actually, uh, please specify what is Marty and uh, also Arkala OH. 8x is not fam I'm not a radio ham operator, so I don't know which. Uh, you're probably referring to some ham station up in northern Finland. Mika, can you hear me? Uh, yeah. Yeah, Risto here. Uh, uh, they are referring to Martti Laine, who is the uh, one of the leading ham operators of Finland, known for many many the expeditions, and the Arkala station is located close to Oulu, to very oh, okay. good okay. Ham location. Uh, I hope this helps. All right, so always like in, in the north-south dimension, it's like halfway in, in, in Finland. And so our location is quite far up uh, further north, uh, 700 kilometers further north or 600 kilometers further north. And, and uh, propagation conditions and uh, are totally different up, up there. Has anyone else got any questions? Uh, hi, Mika, this is Ian. Uh, mm -hmm. how, how does the Aurora affect conditions uh, reception on broadcast band? Um, it, it does affect tremendously and uh, it, it can be really surprising anytime you have any sort of geomagnetic disturbances the, uh, the either the AM band goes entirely quiet or you see an enhancement of signals from direct south. So actually like a moderate uh, solar storm is very uh, conducive for picking up African signals, uh, Middle East signals if that's something you want to hear. Uh, but if, if it's really severe, you know, you can, you can forget about DXing and go skiing instead or taking pictures of the Northern Lights for a couple of days. Uh, 
and and protons are especially if there's like a proton event that tends to tends to uh, destroy long distance AM reception. Thanks. Uh, may I add to this that uh, uh, going DXing uh, in Lapland uh, uh, during the solar minimum is uh, quite a good time, but if you go during the during the solar maximum, it's more like a lottery. If you stay there for one week, you might hear a lot of stations. You, you might hear nothing. So yeah, it, it, I, I, I would personally recommend at least like a way. I, I know that vacations are <laughs> not that long as as, in, as they are in Finland and in many other countries, but I, I'd still recommend that if anybody wants to come on a day expedition in Lapland, that they would reserve at least one week of listening for, for, for that day expedition and not just a weekend because then it would be a total, uh, you know, uh, it would be really haphazard on what you get, but you know, if 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 you happen to have like really good days, you can you can you can log 500 North American stations in one single day, or or a couple of hundred of the stations from Asia on a, on one single day. But then again, if you have a like a major solar storm, what do you do? You don't you you can forget about DXing entirely. So I I personally try to spend on most of my D vacation DX vacations up in Lapland. I I usually spend two weeks at a time. So I, that's pretty much guaranteed of uh, getting several quiet days with excellent reception. A little bit silly question, but uh, do you have any remote reception capability? You can listen from home? Uh, I, I don't. I, I personally uh, in, enjoy this uh, uh, hobby, uh, like, like having like a hands-on uh, 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 up in Lapland and and Aikinemi. We we do have one FM antenna that's been used remotely, but we want to spare the AM capabilities for the DXs who are listening live in Aikinemi at any given time. I think you said that you have an internet connection from at, at the lab there, right? Yeah. So remote reception can be done. Oh, it could be done. Yeah, it's yeah. just that we don't we don't want to have it. There. We want to we want to uh, spare the uh, the the uh, uh, unique opportunities for anyone who bothers to go wow. up there personally. Okay. Thanks. Any other questions from anybody? There is one in the chat. Uh, do you worry about too many countries switching off their medium wave AM stations? Yeah, well, that 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 is an issue, and I, I'd say from our perspective, of course, you know, another man's uh, interference is another man's DX, and vice versa. Uh, of course, we don't worry about the power European powerhouses going off the air at all. On the contrary, that's good news for us, and uh, especially uh, if you look at the past decade, uh, Russian stations leaving the AM band entirely, that was really good news because we had, uh, well, there's a couple of re uh, remaining stations in St. Petersburg, for instance, but not that many. So that was really good news for us, and uh, stations uh, like um, German AM stations leaving the air, that was good news for us, and uh, now, now Many Central European countries are, are planning the same. At least I, I think the Czech Republic would be next uh, around New Year. Um, so we, we really don't miss those stations at all. But on the other hand, like Brazilian stations, it's been one of our main target areas. There used to be several thousand AM stations in Brazil, not just a few years ago. But the, the, the slide has been uh, quite dramatic over the past two years. And I, I think now there's maybe 600 left. Uh, that's still quite an amount, but it's nothing compared to what it was like five years ago. So uh, that's that's a pity. But then again, if you have like in, in my case, I already have like three, four hundred AM stations verified from Brazil. Uh, as, as as they go off the air, new ones come up, and 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 so on. It's the band keeps on changing, and there's always new opportunities. Anyway, so but I I think the. Uh, 
the, the, the sort of the big AM countries like Australia, Japan, US, we would uh, really, really be missing, uh, missing a lot, lot of the excitement if, if the AM band becomes uh, obsolete in any of those countries. So that would, that would be a big drawback. And uh, those, those are really uh, some of our favorite target areas. And as we know, uh, for instance, in Japan, the NHK one and two networks are planned to be combined in in some point in the future in not too distant future and uh, that, that's a pity they 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 are very interesting targets thank you there's another question um do you do any dx in of non-broadcast stations utilities for example yeah. um I, I think it's um this is one of those questions where you start of the national cultural DXs in every country develops differently and uh, in Finland it's it's just that the broadcast stations have been vastly uh, uh, popular uh, more popular uh, one of my good friends is doing utility DXing but it's really not a very popular popular uh, field of, of DXing and actually this utility DX he's been spending this past week in Aikini and has been very happy with the results especially since that we've got these antennas pointing to just about all directions. So it's, it's a paradise for him. And uh, it, it, it is a very good place for utility texting as well, uh, on, on low, uh, on, especially on frequencies below the AM, AM, AM band. As you can imagine, beverage antennas are very directional and uh, work really nicely. And do you do any shortwave broadcast listening? Yeah. Um, very rarely. Uh, maybe some of the new low power stations on shortwave that keep on popping up in uh, in Europe or Australia. Or but I, I you know, ninety five percent of shortwave stations operating in the world, I already got them verified. So there's not that many uh, targets to uh, uh, try to listen to. Okay, there's another question now. What, what's your favorite all time radio and do you use SDRs? Uh, as, as for all time uh, um, receivers, my, my, I, before the SDR era, I used to have an NRD535 and NRD545. Uh, but uh, after SDRs came to the market, I, I haven't looked back and I and like. Receivers like S, S, uh, SDRIQ were pretty soon replaced by Perseus. And of course, Perseus now is, represents technology that's already over a decade old. And it's going to be really interesting what's, what's going to be sort of like the next uh, ruling receiver in this particular class. And uh, whatever the Jaguar software is going to be operating with will be my choice because as, as an interface, as a software, it's, uh, it's, it's actually, um, I don't know how many are you, of you are familiar with it. It's specifically designed for uh, AM band DXing to go with uh, the Perseus receiver because the, uh, the manufacturers of Perseus receiver have not been very responsive in terms of developing the software. And, uh, and so this is much more like a DX friendly software to run the Perseus receiver and whatever, whatever is the new next receiver that the uh, Jaguar accommodates that's going to be on my shopping list. Are there any, um, any improvements you would like to see or that you could predict? How it, could it get any better? Uh, I guess it could, uh, could get better all the time and uh, uh, we've, uh, I, Actually, I don't, for instance, think that uh, there's been many experiments no, done. No, with I decided that after one hour and a half. Uh, uh, so I, I, I don't know if a lot of people have even experimented with even longer beverage antennas, say like one and a half kilometers, two kilometers. We might have that opportunity in some of the directions uh, to get extremely directional beverage antennas. and. Uh, that's something that we might try, for instance, regarding the U.S. East Coast, which tends to be very crowded. And uh, 
that particular area on those latitudes tends to be dominated by stations in the, in the Great Lakes area rather than catching the very narrow slice on the East Coast. So that's something that we may be looking into in the future. Thanks for that. Um, if, if anyone's got any other questions, please go ahead and we could just open it up as well for the last uh, half an hour for any general radio chat or other related um, questions. Rishi, I, I have a comment to Mika's presentation. Uh, I would say that uh, I'm, first of all, I have to say that I have myself been uh, mostly inactive for 20 years now as, as a medium wave DXer. I mean, sometimes I'm not much, but uh, I have to say that Mika and his uh, friends and all, all those who have been medium wave DXing these times have been uh, very lucky so that in, uh, just, I have in some of my presentations described it as uh, the golden age of, of the medium wave DXing these last 20 years, because so much has happened. We have been hearing about these uh, great uh, sites uh, like Aikiniemi. Uh, that's one of the bon points. Uh, then uh, the introduction of SDR receivers was very important. Uh, the uh, big bio powerhouses in, in Europe going down, like Mika said, that has helped a lot. And of course, we also have to remember the extended AM band it was uh, introduced about 20 years ago, something like that. So I, I really, really would say that it's been so great. And uh, I hope that there will still be stations available for 10 and 20 years at least. Uh, I heard that uh, in Japan, the AM stations will be closed down, but uh, whoa, was it just NHK or was it everything? I don't know. Uh, but there's still a lot to, to listen and so on. So I wish you very good times in the future as well. Thank you. Yeah, indeed. I mean, if anybody is thinking of uh, uh, expanding their hobby to the AM, AM sphere, now is the time to do it. It's, we've got excellent SDR receivers. Uh, the band is exceptionally quiet because of less interference and we still have Quite a, quite a bunch of AM stations on the air all around the world. So it's it's pretty exciting. Right, so a good question from Sheldon. He's asking if we can introduce which DX clubs are represented here today. Um, I'm not 100% sure of all of them. I can certainly start by saying that the, the British DX club is here and um, which I'm involved with as well. So we have a bulletin, um, a monthly bulletin called communication, which we still print, but we also have a PDF version, which is good in that it saves on airmail costs. Uh, but we, that's a monthly bulletin of around 52 to 60 pages. So that's, um, and we have members like the Canadian International DX Club members from all over the world. Um, what other we've got this uh St. Petersburg DX organization. I don't know if Alexander wants to say anything about that. Um, otherwise, would anyone else is anyone here from other clubs that they'd like to mention? I'm uh a Japan Show Club, uh, member around 350, still issuing printed bulletin. I'm presuming there's the, is the, um, the, the Finnish DX League, is that? That's another one that's here today. Um, okay. So yeah, I, don't, I think that's there's, there's probably five or six. Um, there's, the good thing, I suppose, is that we're um, international and there's a lot of overlap with between all the organizations so many members are many of us here are probably members of more than one group 
Um, is uh, someone's just asking about a replay facility? Yes, the, the, the meeting is being recorded, Ian, and I'll put it up onto the EDXC YouTube channel hopefully later this evening, um, and I'll send a link round to people when that's up. So does anyone else have anything they want to add or discuss DX wise? I'd like to ask uh, Mika. Unfortunately, I missed. Uh, you, you you told uh, that uh, any DXer could could visit your DX cabin, and uh, what are the price? Please repeat that. It's uh, eight hundred euros per week per cabin, so that allows for two DXers. Okay, per cabin or for two cabins. Uh, well, for two cabins, for both of the cabins, yeah, for the base, 800 euros per week per uh -huh. Ikenemi base, yeah. Uh -huh. Yes, I see. Uh, and another question, uh, where is the switching uh, box for your antenna situated? In the cabin or outside? Uh, no, the, the, the boxes are at the end of each antenna, which, uh, you know, the distance depends uh, from 200 to 500 meters from the cabin. All but right. also, I should add that anybody uh, who wants to come to Aikinemi for the first time, we request that the first visit be arranged with one of the DXs who has previously been in Aikinemi. So that we, because we want to introduce you to the base, we want to give you the best possible experience. So we want to show exactly how everything functions, which antennas to use, in what circumstances what time of the day, and also how everything operates in Aikinemi. Uh, so like um, from a particular country, if, if you want to come to Aikinemi, if somebody comes first with one of our group members for one week, then he knows how everything operates. And the following trip, he can come with this uh, best buddy DX from elsewhere who hasn't been in Aikinemi yet. So that's how we sort of extend the circle one at a time, and we want to make sure that uh, everything functions well, and you get the most out of your DX in week. Mm -hmm. So I guess it's possible to get to to the cabin by car from abroad. Uh, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes, I see. Thanks. For many foreigners, it's of course easier to fly in, and uh, you know you don't have to necessarily just fly into Helsinki and and take a car or train from Helsinki. But you can you can uh, you can get a, there are daily flights to Ivala, which is only one and a half hours drive from or max two hours drive from Aikinemi, and you can rent a car from Ivala. So it's uh, it's it's actually quite quick to surprisingly quick to get to Aikinemi from abroad. And how it is possible to get uh, from Ivalo? Well, from Ivalo, if you arrive at the airport, you have to rent a car from the Ivalo airport. But again, you know, if this is your first trip, then you would uh, arrange a week in Aikinemi where one of us ate. And, uh, you know, then we'll see what the practicalities are if any of us is using their own car or if both are flying in and renting a car, whatever. It depends on the situation. Oh, okay, thanks. Yes, a couple of years ago, I think it was 2017, a, a group of us after the EDXC conference um, in Tampere did go up there, well, we, but we, we were doing a road trip, there were around 12 of us, but we, we only spent about an hour there, so it wasn't time enough to do any DXC, but it certainly was an amazing location, and yeah, I think a lot of people would appreciate getting back there and trying it for themselves. Uh, Chrissy, I'm just curious. Uh, you seem to be, I think, in looking at all the little boxes here, you seem to be the only lady present here today. Mm -hmm. um, it, that seems to be a common thread in your groups of, uh, of radio clubs. It certainly is within our own here. Um, just wondered if that's the same in your part of the world. Yeah, um, Uden from Denmark was... Um hoping to be here this afternoon but she couldn't make it um but yeah that's generally the habit I, I think in the british dx club there are a handful of 
other women DXs, and we have about 500 members. Um, yeah, I've obviously often wondered about that. I, I, I've always assumed it because it's a hobby that a lot of, I mean, most of us here are of a certain age, and perhaps we come from a time when radio as a hobby wasn't, although people listen to the radio, getting into it from the DX in perspective perhaps wasn't something that girls and women did so much. I don't know. Um, I also, I do write for a radio user magazine, which is a latest version, I suppose, of a shortwave magazine, which is a UK publication. And the editor there is trying to recruit more female writers. And, and there are, are a few people, but it's, it seems to be a situation globally in, in the DX hobby anyway. But then not on the side when you look at um, presenters and people in radio. Um, last month I was at the Radio Days Europe conference in, in Lisbon in Portugal, which is professional broadcasters, um, everyone from engineers to podcasters to directors and a lot of presenters. And, and they've achieved now um, amongst the speakers and there are probably, there must be a couple of hundred speakers there because it's a three day conference, four streams, and they've achieved gender parity of 50% of the speakers are female, 50% of male, and the quality of speakers certainly doesn't diminish. Um, so yeah, it, I think it's, I, I, that, I've got no idea how this could be improved or why it's really evolved, but I, I don't know if anyone else has. Yeah, we we only boy. I'm trying to think offhand. Uh, we have Janice, uh, who's been a longtime member here in Montreal, who's been you know into radio DXing since she was a kid. Uh, but other than that, I I'm trying to think of our 200 plus members. I don't at this point. I don't think there is another woman on the membership list. So that's one out of out of two hundred and some odd. It's uh, it's really quite. I find it a little bit odd, but then again, you know, uh, people find what we do a little bit odd. So, <laughs> so, so I guess it comes down to that. And uh, I wonder you know, if it applies. It, perhaps it applies to other odd hobbies as well, such as train spotting or plane spotting. I don't know. Yeah, I think so. I think so. Has anyone else got anything they want to, to add in? Um, I see from the, or saw last night on the, the British DX Club chat that Radio Cairo has made a return to shortwave, although I'm still not sure if anyone can understand what they're saying. Like, 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 Chrissy, um, I'm here. I'm just wondering, as a quick question for Sheldon, I'm just wondering if there are any plans for a, uh, um, like an SWL Winterfest next year. I certainly enjoyed the last one, and I'm wondering um, if there is one planned for 2022. Um, if it will be zoomed, and um, any plans like to zoom it? Yeah, um, I did receive a message from uh, the organizers, and it looks like it will be another virtual Winterfest this year, uh, which will make it available online to everyone. It was very successful last year, allowing you know an awful lot of people from from so many different locations who could not physically get to the to the event in Pennsylvania. So. Um, you know, given the ongoing situation with uh, with COVID, and uh, you know, a lot of people are not comfortable yet uh, traveling and gathering in in large groups. So it looks very much like it will be another virtual event, uh, probably end of February, very early March, what have you, somewhere in that period. They're just starting to discuss it, but um, I think we at this point we can pretty much count on it being virtual. Um, we've CIDX has already offered our services to run the uh, 
the hospitality suite again, which was a lot of fun last year for any of you that were there. Uh, we basically kept the thing open for the whole <laughs> the whole weekend and uh, people were popping in and out of the chat room uh, throughout the weekend and we got to meet so many great people and uh, it was, uh, you know, the next best thing to being there. And for some people, it was the only way for them to be a part of it. So uh, I, I think uh, we're, you know, if it's, it, it probably will be Zoom and, uh, we um, will certainly uh, be looking forward to seeing everybody again uh, through the Zoom technology. Yeah, many thanks for that. Um, it's good to know. Yeah, I think that worked really well. And one of the um, few positives of COVID, of course, is that meetings like this are able to take place and we could put faces and names together. A lot of people <laughs> know name, seen names for years and years and never actually got to meet, uh, particularly on different sites, well, for Europe and North America and, and, and Asia and other countries. So it's it's a great opportunity, I think. And the Winterfest was was good fun this year, wasn't it? Yeah. Was that did it go online in 2020 or did you meet in 2020? We just snuck it in under the under the wire. Um, I think we got back home uh, and uh, all hell started breaking loose like a, a couple weeks after the, the event. So uh, there were probably already some cases floating around out there if, looking back on now when, you know, when they were first detecting COVID. So we uh, fortunately, uh, <laughs> I think everybody got home safe from the, the last in-person Winterfest. Uh, so, uh, yeah, it looks like uh, this year will be a repeat of last year. And uh, I know a lot of people have, have already indicated, you know, they're, they're quite happy with that. There have been some dis brief discussions of possibly, you know, down the road uh, of a hybrid type of event where there will be a, a, an in-person element to the event, but also an online element to it as well. So that uh, people who just you know physically cannot get to the event can still participate. Uh, you know we're not quite sure how that'll all work out, but it's something uh, that I know the organizers want to look at down the road. If my, my memory serves correct, which may not, but it was only probably a week after that we got back from Plymouth meeting that the mall across uh, from the hotel got shut down because of the COVID outbreak, and uh, you know some of our guys were there. So, yeah, uh, yeah, it wasn't very long. Yeah, that's very true. It was uh, it was really cutting it close. Uh, for those that had never been, uh, the the Winterfest is held in a place called Plymouth Meeting, Pennsylvania, which is just uh, just outside of Philadelphia. You basically call it Philadelphia, and uh, the hotel that we use directly across the street from it is is a big shopping mall with uh, a lot of restaurants and stuff like that in it, and people going over and picking up snacks and what have you. And as Mickey was just saying, it was literally one week after we left Winterfest that they shut that mall down uh, because of COVID cases that uh, were detected there. So yeah, it was it was pretty close to, uh, <laughs> to being a, a, a really big problem. So um, yeah, the, the uh, and and you know we're 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 not out of it, not out of the woods by any means. Here in Quebec, uh, in the Montreal area, we've had uh, the highest number of new cases since uh, September uh, happened yesterday uh, in our area. So you know, as people are opening up and trying to do things. Uh, bad things are happening in some cases. So uh, I saw yesterday on TV, on, I think it was on CNN, that uh, over half of the United States are, uh, of the individual states are seeing dramatic increases in cases again. Um, talks of a fifth wave coming. Um, yeah, it's, it's far, from, far from over, unfortunately. You know, it, it seems to, you know, peak, peaks and valleys that we're running into. Uh, in different parts of the world. So um, the province so, of Manitoba put in some restrictions yesterday for uh, for 18 and unders. Wow. Uh, so that's where they're uh, they're looking at right now. So. Yeah. Yep. So um, I think we can pretty much count on a uh, on a virtual winter fest come uh, come end of February, early March. 
And I saw there was one question from Ian in the US uh, wondering when we might be thinking of a CIDX event in Edmonton. Uh, we've been kicking that around. I, Mick, I guess we were looking towards early fall of yeah, uh, 2022. Like, uh, you know, in the September, later September, you know, after yeah. mid September. That seems yeah. to be the best uh, time. Uh, we, we had a still fabulous year right now into November, but. Um, you know the weather could be uh, an issue, but uh, just uh, just for radio listening too, uh, just getting into the September uh, later September is yeah, it's prime. So that's where we'll kind of circle Hope. the calendar for right now. And yeah, and hoping that. hoping that we can do stuff like that in uh, in September of 2022. I would yeah. certainly hope so. Uh, I would like to uh, mention that uh, in previous years I've been compiling a small, uh, let's say, very basic, plain list about uh, coming uh, shortwave DX and radio meetings. I, I have I done it. I did it every January, I think, and I did it also for 2020. But of course, after that, uh, everything went wrong. And I didn't do it for this year, of course. But uh, if you feel that it's helpful, I could try to do it in the next January. Perhaps, I don't know. Yeah. And uh, why not to add uh, remote uh, meetings as well, internet meetings, if uh, there's information in enough about them in the in, in, in the good time. But then again, uh, I, I, only, I only do it in uh, once a year. I, I, don't, I don't update it constantly. So maybe someone could uh, uh, develop a better uh, system for that so that it could be uh, kept somewhere in the, in the web and, and then uh, could be updated uh, uh, regularly but uh, that's just an idea what do you think about that that's that sounds a really good idea to me Riz. So we, we could also we could put it on the your, your edxc website and also update it from time to time but yeah i, I think as a Sudipta just said in the, in the chat as well the great thing about the virtual meeting is that people can attend from anywhere and there isn't the cost of flights or transport or hotels. So for a lot of people, it's their best opportunity to, to meet up with fellow DXs. So yeah, I, I, I'd say compile the list and perhaps anyone who's organizing events here, if they could send you their, their list of events and we can update it from that. Yeah, we'd, I know we'd certainly entertain you know anybody sending us material we could you know keep an ongoing list and you know we're i, I mentioned we're in the process of, of wanting to redo our website um uh, you know and there's plenty of places that you can post it up whether it's in the, you know there's i don't know if anybody's uh i spend way too much time on facebook but <laughs> but there are so many groups of you know specialty radio groups uh, shortwave listening groups medium wave groups um and you look down the list of names of the people that are in these groups and these are not these are not names we recognize there are a lot more of us out there who we don't know and they don't know of us um, you know, so the, the ways to try to get that word around to, to bring those people together, you know, we have many more tools available for us to do that sort of thing now. So the more places you can put things like that, um, we, we have a member in CIDX right now who is trying to, um, you know, contact all of the, there's actually a special show coming up on, uh, is it? Texas shortwave radio shortwave that's doing the anarch uh, tribute to all of the, uh, the 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 remaining anarch clubs that are still out there even though anarch itself doesn't exist we've got somebody in CIDX that's looking at trying to put a history uh, um, sort of a, a 
a memorial almost website together about anarchs so that you know that it's documented somewhere i have hundreds of pictures here from anarch conventions of the past that aren't anywhere other than sitting in my photo album that you know if we can start gathering that sort of stuff together and leave a trail behind us and and make this stuff available to people who you know who don't know about us about the organized groups i think you know, there's a lot of potential out there for us to repopulate ourselves. And, uh, you know, if there are club events going on, conventions, uh, Zoom meetings that are open, that, that anybody anywhere can join into, uh, if we've got a way of publicizing that stuff, I think it really would be great. And, um, you know, I, I know, I think, I, I don't think any of our CIDX people would object to seeing a, a listing of that published somewhere. Uh, you know, uh, lots of places that it can be posted for sure. Yeah, but that's a really, yeah, really good idea. And I think, um, I know Mike, in, who's in the meeting today, he does a lot of posting to different groups and quite often they're groups I've not heard of either. So there's a lot of, lot of people out there to contact still. And if you've got something useful to, to share, such as a list of meetings, that would be a really positive next step, I think. You know, a very funny thing happens every year with Winterfest. One of the things that I took on to help the guys out that organize it is I, I have a listing of all these radio related Facebook groups, shortwave and utilities and whatever. And every year I post uh, the information about Winterfest on there. And strangely enough, I could probably count on the fingers of one hand the number of people that are in those groups that we don't know, you know, names we don't recognize, who've decided, hey, I'm going to pick myself up and go to a Winterfest. So I, when I try to explain to people what we do, what our DX clubs and stuff, because, you know, people look at you and they go, like, why do you need a club to listen to the radio? It doesn't make sense to them. I kind of look at it and I compare it to, to cameras. Um, probably every single one of us have a camera and millions and millions of people around the world have them, whether it's on your phone or whether you have a standard camera. But how many people join a photography club? It's, it's the same thing, you know, that, that people... People say that people joining things right now seems to be on the decline in general. People just like to go out and do their own thing and, and what have you. So this, this, this culture that we have of the DX groups and the clubs uh, is, is maybe something that's generational, that's maybe not as attractive to newer people coming in. I, I, I don't know. You know, we sit and wonder about this all the time. But I think it's, you know, it's very unique what we do. And there are other people who do what we do, but they don't find us or they, they're kind of doing it on their own and they just, you know, don't stumble onto us. So uh, I think it's just the way it is. And I don't know if that will change very much, but I use that as an example of trying to publicize something like Winterfest. Um, and so many people in all of those groups. I mean, there are some of those groups that have like 10,000 plus members in them in a Facebook group who are these people that took the time to join a group like that? You know, they obviously, you know, I, I hope they know what they're joining. So they've got to have some knowledge of what the subject matter is yet. You know, we'll, we'll never hear or see those people. It, it, it's really strange. I just find it really, really odd. That's interesting. Yeah. A lot of untapped potential out there for us to, um, to try and, <laughs> Pull out, put into our directions, perhaps. Yeah. Okay. Sheldon, you you mentioned that, and uh, some people here know I I post information for Texas Radio Shortwave, and you know I look at the likes and loves, and you know thumbs up and things like that. Look at I look at the names, and then occasionally I see the list of people who send reports to Texas Radio Shortwave, and they're not the same people. You know, the people who are indicating that they like what's posted or they're interested in what's posted or whatever, of course, they may be listening, 
because I'm not silly enough to try to equate, you know, listeners with reporters, but the names very seldom ever match up when you look at the, when you look at the list. And so I, this is the same thing that you and Chrissy are talking about. There are all these people, Austin City Limits, you got a QSL. All <laughs> right. That was a that was a great show, by the way, on Texas Radio Shortwave. Um, you know, there are people out there who we will never talk to who are interested in the kinds of things we do. And, you know, the radio clubs, one of the, I don't know, one of the odd things was, you know, they decided to stay in business or go out of business. And of course, they were producing a, a, a product, they were producing a bulletin, but based on the number of members, when, I, you know, there's no real correlation that I've ever seen or that I've seen in research on, on uh, 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 listeners, there's no correlation between listeners and the people who, you know, may, may post or who like a particular Facebook post or, or whatever. So, you know, they were, they were making their decisions as they should have based on listeners, I'm sorry, based on members, when the members and, and you know, their audience, let's say, um, probably weren't the, you know, to a large extent, probably weren't the same people. And uh, Otaki, uh, I hope I got pronounced that right, did the best I can. I'm Texan and, you know, we, I can get Sheldon Harvey right but maybe nobody else. I, I sent you a, a message in chat. So if you'd have a chance to uh, respond to that, I would appreciate it. And that's everything I got to say for right now anyway. Thanks very much. Um, well, it's, it's um, 1700 now. So I'd like to try and finish on time because I'm sure people have other things to go along to or <laughs> to go to bed or have breakfast or depending on whereabouts in the world you are. Um, thanks to our speakers and thank you for everyone coming along. I think we reached about 42 people at, at, at the peak here today. Um, and we'll let you know when the next meeting is, is coming up. I'll try and put the recording of this online. And it's been great to talk to everybody and what, what an interesting international bunch we are. And, we can only grow. Mika, uh, Mika's got a hand up there. I think he wanted to add something. Yeah, uh, nothing special. I just actually <laughs> wanted to announce that I need to go now. But uh, uh, if anybody wants to reach me, uh, you can easily just you know find me on the internet or just uh, Mika DX Makedanen on Facebook. Uh, be in touch, and if you have any questions about Aichinimi, feel feel free to ask also later on. Anyway, great to see so many of you. Thanks for your company and uh, enjoy the night or whichever time of the day it is in your part of the world. Bye-bye. Bye, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Okay, thanks everybody. See you again soon and stay safe everyone. Bye.